Okay, so we've got a couple people in the chat and enough people in the room. We're going to get going. Uh, no, you're fine. Uh, if someone on Zoom could just unmute to say, can you hear the audio? Not sure. Nobody, yeah, maybe not. Uh, oh, can you can hear? Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, so this is not super structured. It's more of like, B Blender is, is such a big amalgamation of different tools that there's not really any one sensible way to like try to, to cut it up into learning chunks. So uh, there's like a little toy example that we've got. It's going to take like 20 minutes and then from there it's sort of like we can, what depending on the things you guys are interested in seeing, we can go down various respective rabbit holes. Um, but to start the, the, the toy examples, we'll make a rubber duck because those are kind of complex geometrically, but not, not really. And uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can manipulate geometry in Blender, but the most traditional way is something called box modeling, which is where you literally start with a cube like this. Uh, and this cube has eight separate vertices, which you can manipulate individually. Ooh, what's happening? Did the meeting end? Did I get booted from the... Just a moment. It does look like we were kicked out of All right. <laughs> then you know this isn't going on Zoom. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's, I'm recording it anyway, so for, for posterity, whatever. Uh, we, we've got it on OBS, so this will be, this will be fine. Let me just... So on a surface level, this reminds me of Unity, but can you give us an overview of what... Yeah, e exactly, yeah. So... Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to put this on Zoom just because I don't want to deal with it, but it's being recorded. Um, Blender predates Unity by about a decade. Uh, it's closer in spirit to something called 3D Studio, or some of the early modeling programs from the 90s. Um, and Essentially, it, it started as a modeling package, but now it's used for physics simulations, fluid simulations, 2D animation, 3D animation, game asset pipelines. Um, it's, it's got a lot of funding from various consortiums and, and, and development is, is directed in an open source project through a foundation in the Netherlands. So they've got maybe a dozen people on staff full time and then a pretty big community. Uh, the, the crux of it though is is uh, it's not voxel data or anything fancy, it's all just polygons. Um, so this is the simplest one. Every Blender file starts with a cube. Um, and cubes are made of points, and the points are grabbable. Uh, if you select two points, that's an edge. And if you select a bunch of contiguous points that bound an area, that's a face. Uh, and that's kind of it. The rest of Blender is just manipulating faces, edges, and points. Um, there are some. You, you might be wondering, like, how do you how do you get from a uh, six-sided cube up to something with millions and millions of faces? Because if you look down in the corner here, I'm I'm kind of blocking it. At the moment, there's just eight vertices. Uh, but there are these things called modifiers that let you semi-procedurally build up um, resolution very quickly. And 
and the aspect ratio is different. So the menu looks different. <laughs> there we go. Sorry, I'm looking for a very specific one. Subdivision surface. So this is, this is the modifier maybe you'll use most often. Um, subdivision is uh, just taking a face and turning it into more faces. And the simple way, it doesn't, it doesn't alter the, the existing vertices at all if we apply this right here. We got booted out of the Zoom, oh, okay. and the clock's ticking, and someone else is sitting on the link. So I'm, I'm recording it on OBS, but we can, oh. yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. There weren't, sure? yeah, there weren't that many people. In the, yeah. No, because Chris wants to listen to you, that's why. And there's several yeah. people on the Zoom link. Yeah. That, that's fine, but I can't get in, and we're 10 minutes past our start, so okay. it's, yeah. I mean, you're welcome to come in here. Yeah. Um, sorry, just a moment. So if, if you see here, now that little modifier took our faces and the, the, the terminology is subdivide, but it, it kind of recursively, like, it, 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 I, I, don't, I don't know how the operations work under the hull, but, but it procedurally makes geometry more complex. And, and doing it in, in this fashion is of limited utility. Um, because what is most useful for artists in particular is taking something like a cube uh, and oh so yeah now this is what it's now now yeah okay is that too big the helper text is a little overwhelming so yeah, you, you can take something like a cube and, and using this Catmull Clark subdivision, which is a more sophisticated algorithm, uh, now you're constructing shapes that are more organic. Um, but what's useful is the, the control points from the original cube are still valid. So now I can start to make uh, oblong shapes. And I can actually extend and extrude geometry in strange ways. And make. And uh, another really important thing in Blender is this concept of loop cuts, which is it's smart enough to be able to look at a collection of vertices with edges, and and you you can figure out there's you 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 cut into the mesh, and and by mm -hmm. taking vertices closer together, you you tighten these these sort of concavity inflection points. Um, so you can imagine how, how pretty quickly you're, you're able to, to build complex shapes. And uh, in particular, there are other important, the mo other most important one is this thing called mirror. So you, you, can, you can take geometry and, and procedurally flip it over arbitrary numbers of axes, um, which in terms of like, and a, and a lot of like character workflows where you're building organisms that demonstrate bilateral symmetry, it's, it's common that you'll just author one half of a manifold and then flip it over and have a, have a new one. Uh, so I've, like I was, let me see, yeah, that'll be smaller. Yeah, okay, that's a little better. When I was sizing the, the the annotations that was on a higher resolution screen than the projector allows. Um, so everything in Blender, the, re the reason the UI is so impenetrable for a lot of people is, is because it's, it's not, it wasn't originally graphical. It's, it's mostly shortcuts and, and either with keyboard keys or typing in commands manually. Uh, all the graphical bindings are just talking to Python scripts. So it's very easy to automate stuff in Blender. Um, there are a part, so meshes, that's anything with, with vertices. There's all these other different kinds of geometry that you can, you can do. Um, so kind of like, uh, you know, handles and things. And, and you can convert back and forth between different representations of geometry. Um, but but for, for beginning, uh, it's, 
best to just stick to things like cubes. So um, to build a duck, we need to, we're going to have a layer of subdivision and then uh, we're going to make a bilateral cut right down the middle. And then we can actually just throw out one half of the model uh, like that. And now we're, we're, we've functionally restored the information we had before. We're just creating it procedurally. Um, right. And I just I haven't spoken publicly in a while. I'm sorry if I if I seem flustered. That's why. But so ducks loosely are kind of you know the, the, the oblong. The, the there's not much to to talk over here. But uh, you will notice I've made a couple mistakes. So the way I'm scaling things looks uniform from this side. But if I scroll up, uh oh. That's no good, right? So, so you have to be careful with these workflows because it's easy to manipulate geometry from one perspective and then find out that what was coherent from one point of view is actually causing problems from, from other points of view. But luckily, this, this mirror modifier is smart enough to automatically merge vertices that are in sufficient proximity to an axis. So if I can get them a little closer. We need to up the clipping tolerance. Is there some sort of timeline function or similar where you can go back and change something like that? It's past? not CAD, unfortunately. So the closest thing to that is these modifiers stack. So if you if you if you modify something at the bottom Oh, actually, that, that's so thank you, because look, so if I take this mirror, right now it's mirroring the procedural geometry, but if I uh, change the stack, because if you think about it, what's, what's happening is this is what's getting mirrored, and this is what's getting subdivided, whereas before we were doing the subdivision first and then mirroring the subdivision. So the order of operations does matter. Not So the stuff that happens over here is destructive. The stuff that happens over here is iterative. So in that sense, it's a little bit like a CAD workflow, but... Um, and then you have the option to suppress some things on that right hand side? Uh, kind of. Like, I can... Yeah. Yeah. Generally, you wouldn't. You would. You would just get rid of it altogether. But, but yeah. Clipping, uh, and you can see we actually this little line right here. That's not good. That's that's like self-intersecting geometry. That's causing problems. And and uh, but you know we only have so much time. Um, yeah. So now we've got also this thing that I'm doing with tab. Um, there's scene representation where you just have a gross object, the macro scale. Uh, if you hit tab, that takes you into editing its individual geometry pieces. Um, the thing we want to do next uh, is give the guy a neck. So there's this thing called a knife tool, which lets you draw arbitrary paths along um, a sh an existing sort of manifold or set of faces. And once you have those, uh, you can play. So you can see we've almost made a hand here, not, not a duck, but, but this is how people make structures fairly rapidly, because you, you take those, those knife tools and uh, it is a destructive process. But now we've got new faces. Where did I make that? Yeah, so you can, you can see it, it, gets, it gets pretty freaky pretty quickly. So when you say it's a destructive process, are you saying yeah. that if you were to flip that over, we would see voids where those two spikes are? I can, you mean like that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. 
Uh, that that's not destructive insofar as that like the modifications are made to the geometry. They're they are permanent. It's it's not like a parameterized CAD workflow where you can step back. Uh, we're still not making a duck. That's fine. And and in in some ways, um, how are we doing on time? Yeah, we're doing fine on time. I can just show you the duck we were working with yesterday. So. <laughs> So here's a duck I made yesterday with Wes, use, use, using that workflow. Um, and you can see, like, it started from a cube, and it's not a cube anymore. Uh, but you can kind of imagine where it came from, now that you've seen a little bit of the workflow. So it's the, the same idea, if I, if I turn this off, that's, that's it without any subdivision. So you know, if you were playing a video game in the 1990s, it would look like this. If you were playing a video game in 2005, it would look more like this. Uh, but the base mesh is the same, and we're still using that same principle of like bilateral symmetry, that you, know, you, you can cut things in half. Um, where, where, where Blender gets interesting is it's, it's not just for building up geometry, it's also for presenting and rendering geometry. So uh, we're fortunate that you know, in the last couple of years, it used to be Blender only had a path tracer. There were no real-time options. But now uh, there's a light in this scene, and it's completely, it's com wow. completely dynamic. Nice. I remember when that came out. Yeah, and the path tracer is still there, and it does look better. But it's and the the feature sets are different. Um, you have multiple light sources. Oh yeah, ar arbitrary. I think it's deferred, so it's as many as you want. Uh, and there's also different kinds of light sources. So you know, we we could we could do if we wanted the uh, traditional three point lighting and make one intensity bigger than the others and, and make that one weaker. And um, if you were like in a photo studio, that's like the, the setup that you might have. So you've got a rim light and all that stuff. But uh, you're not limited to just point lights. There's directional lights. There's sun. Um, this was cranked up a little bit too high. But if you just did 10. Uh, and we can also get things like uh, matte caps. Yeah, this right. So, so uh, the fun stuff with Blender for graphics people is the shader pipeline. Um, so over here, we have all these properties for physically based material. Uh, and if you want to, so there's things like we can make this duck metal, we can make it shiny, but the most important thing is you turn roughness all the way down, nice. it becomes perfectly reflective. And there's just various high dynamic range images you can, you can use. Um, the, yeah, I guess partially dielectric materials are a thing, but uh, so, so the workflow for PBR is that basically materials at a microscopic level are either smooth or rough. And a mirror is a perfectly smooth material. It, it, it reflects light one-to-one um, -one the, the way it comes in is the way it goes out. The angle of incidence is always the same. Yeah. Uh, if you have paper, which is this messy biomass that's stacked up on itself, and it, it, it's diffuse, it scatters light everywhere. A little bit of the incident light comes back, and, and that would be the specular highlight. But most of the light hitting a diffuse object uh, goes off in arbitrary directions, and that's why we get these more uniform shades. What's fun, uh, Blender supports subsurface scattering. So diffuse materials scatter on the surface of an object. But if you look at our skin, our skin's red. The red is our blood, which is underneath the, the yellow stuff, the albumin on our upper layer. Uh, and if you crank that, am I? Here we go, sorry. This is what we wanted, yeah. Uh, base color, it's a little bit hard to tell at the moment. 
but if you if you keep if you take a sort of yellowish base layer and make it a little more red and then you make the red very very saturated I, it's hard to tell you might need to delete some of your lights yeah. There we go. If you make it the sun, you can see that's kind of like skin, a little bit. Um, in particular, we're going for. There's all these parameters you can play with. There's parameters for hair. There's parameters for skin. There's this. Oh, oh. That's a transparency effect, or a we're actually so because sorry we were we were we had we. Roughness and metalness are separate. So you can have metal that's brushed, and that behaves differently than metal that's smooth. Metalness is like to the, I guess it, it's like valence electrons and stuff and all that crap. But um, so if you're doing something organic, you would make it somewhat rough, not all that specular, uh, and that is what we were going for. You see, how it's kind of fleshy. That's because we're able to simulate bounces under the surface of the volume that we've. Bounded. So now it's kind of a rubber duck, a little bit. And um, yeah, let me just check time. So um, this is like the we're right, right here. What we're editing on the right uh, is the endpoint of what can potentially be a much longer workflow. Um, so if Blender has something called a shader editor, where it's a, it's a node-based system where you're able to compose materials. And in particular, uh, you can have, you, you can use texture maps to provide data that varies over coordinate spaces. So right now we're getting one solid uniform color, uh, but if we sample a texture coordinate in the scene and then make a procedural let's say noise texture uh, <laughs> you have to choose there's a couple different frames of reference that you can use for establishing where the texture coordinates coming from um, but if you hook that into base color now we've got a noise map being sampled and applied to our duck. Right. And all of these uh, parameters are, are variable. So you can change the scale of the noise, the detail of the noise, all, all these, even distortion, just some weird stuff. Uh, and if you're familiar with um, Perlin noise, blue noise, any of that stuff. All, all that is pretty much available to you in Blender, and, and you can use it for, for driving various things. So what's more common uh, is maybe not using noise to drive a diffuse layer, um, but instead maybe you use it to produce a normal map. Or not even a normal map. We would, we would actually, in this case, we would, th th there, Differences are subtle, but functionally the same. So uh, we take the not the color, but just the intensity of our noise, use it as a height map, and then plug it into the normal node. And now, if you look at our duck up close, right? Yeah. And so there's there's a lot of potential. Uh, for, sorry, I'm zoomed away too far in. There we go. You can you can see um, for people not familiar with graphics, the the way that shadows are calculated on an object is you take the surface normal of a face and you see is that normal aligning with a light source. And by taking a dot product, you can tell to what degree are those normals in alignment. And if so, if you're facing away from a light source, you're in shadow. If you're facing at a light source, uh, you're lit. The issue is if you take a box, uh, it's going to look flat because the surface normals on it are all like co 
colon, they're all the same. Uh, so there, there are algorithms where you can interpolate normals so that you can take a flat surface and skew the normals a little bit so that it looks like the cube is actually a cylinder. Uh, you can take that a step further and if instead of, and, and plug in something like a noise map and now your normals are stochastically random and you get these weird looking like wrinkles on, on the surface of the duck. And, and that's all procedural stuff. The, what artists will do is not just drive everything procedurally, they will take real world data, uh, like real world photographs, uh, and, and plug that in, into these setups. And so Blender lets you uh, import images as buffers or textures. Uh, so like here are a couple. In, in this context, albedo and diffuse just both mean base color. So like under a white light, under like the sun, here is the color that this material would be. And then that color is blended with the colors of the lights in the world around an object. Um, if I take, sorry. Blender is usually used with a mouse, not, not just a trackpad. But MacBooks have good enough trackpads that when you're doing presentations, uh, you can get away with the stuff. So what you do is you drive the sampling of the texture um, using that same coordinate sampling node thing from before. Uh, and when we do that, now we can read, nope, going to turn off things like the subsurface, maybe, yep. And I'm also going to turn off the bump map. Yeah, OK, so here's a, here's a scan of a photo of someone took of, of snake skin. And you cannot see that at all. I apologize. Uh, maybe. Is, it's good enough. Yeah, I don't. Uh, well, you have a bad feeling. Being, being okay, you, but if you you guys are is legend. Okay, yeah. Uh, when you just sample a diffuse map, you you get the color attributes of the object that you scanned, but you don't get any of that surface data or topographical stuff. Um, so what you can do is. There are ways of encoding normal information in color textures. And you can also encode height information, which is slightly different than the normal information. Uh, so, so there's sets of usually, like the base is you'll have a normal map, you'll have a height map, you'll have an albedo map. Uh, let's take the normal one. And let's take. the height one. And they're all going to be driven by that same texture coordinate that we've introduced as an input to our shader program. Uh, Blender has, you can't really read it. Uh, these, these maps for, for data, not for color, but for data, Blender will handle them differently internally, so you have to annotate them as non-color maps. Um, and once you have, for instance, the normal data, there's uh, nodes for creating normals from these buffers. And once you have those base normals, uh, you are able to hook them into what are called bump maps, which they kind of, normals are like light incidents, bump maps are like spoofing variations in actual like displacement of geometry. So they're, they're related but, but different. And the, the normal map drives it and we need the height map over here. Here. And if you hook this in, now it looks very different. It responds to light in a substantially 
different way because we have all of this simulated detail. And you can see the aliasing. Uh, like we, we filter the texture in a, in a, in a nonlinear way to compensate for the fact that it's quantized. But if you get in real close, you can still see that all this data is sampled from what's ultimately just a bitmap image. Um, and then there are important things like this coordinate space, you can apply transforms to it. So everything is this, we're all just, we're in vector land. Um, so let's see. I don't know if I can overwrite all of them at once, but like, a moment. This will make sense in a sec. Um, okay. What we can do is we can intercept the texture coordinate being sent to us from the external graphics pipeline uh, and, and we can scale it. So we can make the scales look big, or we can make them look small, and then we'll notice, we'll start to notice patterns and banding and artifacting. But, but so there's something called stochastic texturing, where you where you sample textures in a non-linear way, and that avoids those noticeable tiling issues. Um, but yeah, now now it kind of we've got like our snakeskin duck at one level, and if you apply the lighting to it. Um, you can you can see there's things like the ambient world environment uh, maybe the sky is blue or red and you can kind of see how the ambient if you look at the shadow of the duck as I as I change um, the, the color the, the actual color of the shadows so not the primary incident light but the ambient light that's kind of coming out on the background uh, that the shadows change to match the, the color of the ambient lighting. So, so Blender lets you control uh, environmental properties, light properties, mesh properties. It, it's kind of just a giant simulation toolbox. And it's all open source and it's all free. Uh, it's the, the barrier to entry is, is kind of high be, because there are so many workflows within the program that are like non-standard. Uh, if you go to other industry standard tools that are closed source, that, that those those workflows are a little more intuitive because they weren't designed by, you know, a random distribution of developers all over the world. But um, if if you can take the time to familiarize yourself with the workflow, it's it's uh, not so bad. And so yesterday, um, where I ended up with just messing around as I was. Playing with Wes, uh, you can find things like this is where we were. So that's a little terrifying, no? Cool Martian duck. Right, and uh, so that's the same texture, same model. Uh, there's there's the material graph. So what's interesting here is there's there's this flesh on his beak and the scales on his head. Um, which are two totally separate materials, but what you're able to do is you can you can compose things. So using an image mask, so it all it all kind of comes back to image masks, which is to say, uh, nope, not that one. Yeah, so. The, the, the mesh, the duck mesh, which is represented in 3D spaces, can, can be mapped algorithmically into a two-dimensional plane, which lets you line it up with a bitmap, which lets you assign like texture data. Uh, in, in this case, white aspects, white regions are, uh, have a value of one, and black regions have a value of zero. It's, that's just how the color is. Um, if you sample that, if you pipe in the color values from either material, uh, 
what happens is one is the high pass, zero is the low pass. This mix shader says for, for places in the mask that have a value of one, show me the beak for places in the mask that have a value of zero, pass through the scales. And that lets you, so, so here, here's how it looks. Um, what, I, what I want, sorry, let me just snake scan. The UI is pretty clunky. Let me go back to where I was. Nope. Well, believe me when you, you can paint you, you can paint. So so here's another thing. Uh, and and maybe I'll start to wrap up. Um, or if you guys have questions we can do there, Bl Blender has has tools for supporting dynamic retopology. So it, it can if you, so the, the box modeling I showed you at the very beginning, where you manually offer, author everything by taking boxes and changing the boxes, uh, is effective, but also slow. Yeah, and to that end, uh, you are able to just additively draw onto a mesh, or subtractively take away from a mesh. And or it, or? I think it's a voxel representation, but but I, I I don't know. And you can you can do it in such a way that you preserve symmetry. So you know what I've been doing yesterday was was uh, if you have a little bit of intuition for anatomy, you can do things like painting on eye sockets and then making like a zygmoid bone, and now you've got like you, you've you've made the duck a little scary. Uh, the the issue here now is we've destroyed the UV map. So if we go back to the rendered mode, now we've messed we've 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 messed up our mask pretty substantially. So so and anyway, yeah. So <laughs> right right right. But but that's an opportunity to 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 show you. Uh, if we go back into the layout mode, <laughs> so you can see the UV map. Like it's sort of intact, but we've we've done damage to it, and so we can recompute it like that. And now our mask makes no sense. Um, but the 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 thing there is there's there's tools that let you manipulate these textures in on the model like in vivo, sort of. Uh, let me make sure, do I have, no. Something is locked. I need to. Is this like texture paint? This is, yep, exactly. And I'm like zoomed way too far in or something, but what I'm trying to find is the actual material. Sorry. There, oh, okay, I was just scrolled way too far. So if, if you target a texture map, you're able to paint on it in, in real time. Um, and so you, you can see as I'm, as I'm painting and the, the white is showing up on the mask, where, where the mask is modified, it passes through a different material. And, um, yeah, and and then where where the animators come in and do their thing is you know you, you can you can keyframe. Uh, you you do have a you do have a timeline and um, you're able to say things like I want you to track the positioning of this eyeball from here to here, and now if I if I play it back. I don't so so like and all of that stuff uh, can can be export can be baked and exported from Blender into these serial formats that are readable by Unity and Unreal and there's this new thing called Universal Scene Descriptions from Pixar Origin Videos using 
and, and that's how people make assets for, for movies and games and, and, uh, and those sorts of things. And there's, there's also stuff, like I haven't talked at all about the way you make armatures with articulated bones and the inverse kinematic solvers and all this stuff. Uh, so, so Blender is like a big can of worms that, that can be... Show the hairy The hairy, oh, yeah, so, so yeah, 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 that's a good... So the very first version of this was... Is it Demo Duck? I don't remember anymore. Oh, that's on my workstation. Oh. But, 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 that's a good, so, so what Liz is touching on is there's also support for particle simulation. Um, and there's different kinds of particles. You can either just have the classic, like I want smoke particles coming out in a simulation, or you can do hair, like that. Uh, Right, and, and it takes a little bit of massaging, but if you apply, there you go. So r right now it's a mess, um, but you are able to, let me see, even better. I'm looking for, Right. So, so what it's doing right now is it's 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 to, to, it's emitting all of these hairs from from the the manifold of the actual object. But you can also do it for point, or you can even do it. This is good for like gas simulations. You can you can populate a volume with hair uh, and hide the emitter, things like that. But but when you're doing a hair simulation, you'll you'll often do it like this and. Uh, there are physics simulations you can do, and then if you, so gravity, see that, I don't, I can't, just, just a moment, uh, let's make it 40 steps. So Blender, you're making models more than animations? Both. Oh. It's, it's not the strongest for, well, you, 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 you. I suck, so I make my animations. Right, it, it's it's ninety percent as good as the next commercial offering for that. It, 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 so it does both. It does both. It's yeah. intended to be. It, Blender Blender is they they have this project that they do where they'll make uh, they they call them open movies, uh, and they're usually like ten minute clips of something or other that people. Yeah, like if you've ever seen Big Buck Bunny. That. That's oh, yeah. that's an old that's an old blender open movie. Um, there was there was one I think it was man I'm gonna get mess the number up Agent three two seven or something like that from is that Belgium I don't remember where that's a comic but anyway they took a they took a short uh, they, they they came up with a story featuring Agent three two seven and uh, put it up on YouTube and it's also just it's just tech showcases of what you can do with the software but it's end-to-end -end modeling texturing yeah. lighting animation rendering all in blender bunnies everywhere in the theater yeah. so <laughs> if, if we yes that's that's a blender open movie it's a demo from a version of blender from about 10 15 years ago since it's open they can use it to test their nope. streaming yeah. Sorry. Is this old enough that they do money for nothing on this one? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> that was really crude. Uh, you know, see how many sets. I think my one really is like straight up random. Right. Uh, just a moment. Okay, so here's an example of like a very naive <laughs> physics simulation. <laughs> but you, the, the hair is, it, you can do all kinds of dynamic stuff in this ecosystem. And, and certain things, like the, the particle simulations are not as portable as the, uh, the geometry stuff. But there are ways of baking out this data so that even like something like Unity, you can use. The hair won't be denied dynamic like this, but you can, you can bake some of it down to, to, to raw geometry. And yeah, but, but that's a, so Blender is a dangerous. Oh, <laughs> I also think Blender can be motion tracking. Yep. A couple it, of their open movies have done that. 
Yep, there's uh, there's there's stuff for compositing, there's stuff for motion tracking, there's stuff for 2D animation. So that like lately the the new like pushing the envelope is people who will do hybrid 3D and 2D stuff for stylized work. Do you remember what the open movie was that they did when they first introduced that? No, but uh, I yeah. Like a cyborg stream or something like that. Right, right. And they showed the behind the scenes and it's like you'd see a person with a robot arm. It really was a guy with a piece of cardboard with some dots on it tied to his arm. There are, the, the only other thing. It's easy to do it in 3D reviews, but like they'll sell you just packages of motion cap data that if you build your, if you build everything off the same skeleton that they use, you can retarget all of their yep. motion cap, whatever. So, so, wait, so how, does, how, are, how are they capturing the mo like, through open CD or something? Like, what, what are they doing? Like, I keep, I keep, like, are they hooking up a connect to the USB port and then, like, doing... Um, you just take a video of a person with, uh, like, okay. indicator dots on them or something, okay. and they'll track the dots. So the so other thing... Like, um, PlayStation Move. Yeah. There's caustics. So the, the hair... So just as an example of how deep it goes, uh, you can see we've got a light source here, and if we change it to be a... And as it resolves, um, this is like head on, pretty noisy. Uh, can we? It'll hopefully resolve, but yeah. So, so the light transport stuff and and blender is is pretty. It, it's might as well be professional grade. Um, so it's a good it's a good tool if you're a broke student or want to make movies on a low budget. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but that that's all I've got. So if you guys have extra questions or anything, I'm happy to answer. We've got a couple minutes. No questions. Right. Right. So it can do subsurface light. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it can do normals and it can do bond maps, which I imagine you mm. would you be able to approximate materials pretty good, pretty well. Like it's so, so what I'm thinking is like the physically based render it uses is based on a white paper from Disney where the idea was to keep it as physically accurate but make it friendly to artists. So, so, so I think yeah. like, could you start out with like let's imagine that you were that you got at the model, right? And you got it like to the vertices you wanted or whatever. Right. And then you found a way of basically simulating yellow PVC. Mm -hmm. right? Like, would that be a thing? Right? And you soft it soft a, body modeling? You yeah. Like, like well, no, but I'm, think, I'm, I'm thinking about like being able to emulate what, I mean, because a proper dog is made of yellow PVC. Right? Uh huh. Right. So you could you simulate. The material being, oh, you see, not not through your artistic interpretation, but through like doing like, well, I I guess this I works mean, like this. I guess like you know, I don't. It's like semi porous and you got this thing going on. That yeah. kind of like micro molecular structure stuff is not so. So the the proxies for that are this roughness and. Well, I mean, like, you know, I was thinking along those. I was thinking along right. those lines. Like I, was, right. I wasn't thinking along, yeah. you know. So, so the idea is because uh, when you mention metalness and roughness, and I mean, like those have analogs. I mean, like, this is what they're kind of they're they're right. they're, they're instead of actually scattering the light, they're right. using coefficient weighting to right. to to in a convincing way do it. But it's not it's not it's physically based, not physically accurate. Okay. It, it's more of it's 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 more oh. the the properties of of uh, energy conservation and I, dial dielectric material. I, f I forget now. There's there's like just a moment. This is Marmoset's got a good breakdown of of all these different all all these different terminologies, but but most materials. If you you can reverse engineer them to look approximately like, you know, but but yeah, I can I can drop this link in the 
the, the slack if you want. It's a good, it, it's for artists, but it kind of goes over the different kinds of, you basically have different data buffers that say which parts of a model should be reflective, which shouldn't be, which should be rough, which should be smooth. And you compose all of that, you bake it down, and, and you throw it in your renderer, and you get, get, you get something like that. Uh, all, all of these workflows became standard maybe maybe seven or eight years ago, around the time. Uh, there's a Disney movie called Zootopia, which had really accurate hair for animals. Mm -hmm. um, but, but PBR, physically based rendering, as it, it was emerged as Disney, Pixar, and then kind of propagated to the rest of the industry through a series of white papers, and now it's just kind of how we capture the, the first a lot of... Right, that would, that, yeah, I, yeah, that, that makes sense. So like in the old day, like the 90s, you have Bing Fong and Gorod shading and all this, this stuff where it's like simple like interpolations of light and this is, at this point, we're, we're going, going a bit beyond that. But yeah. Is anyway. Are those real or one of those is blender? They're both fake. Oh, they're two different methods. I, I yeah. was wondering if they look pretty good. That's yeah. One. Yeah, one, yeah, one. So, so there's different, you, you can define things in terms of how metallic something is or how specular it is. And they're kind of interchangeable, but also the way you encode the data is different. And specular, again, just being how much of the incident light comes at you exactly as it was emitted from the source. So if something is completely specular, it might as well be metal because all of that light that's, is... That's like is, the old school, that's the open right. one point one. Uh -huh, yeah, really okay, yeah. Does Blender support full pass? Cycles is a path tracer, and that's why it's so slow, and that's why it can do caustics. It's it's not a ray tracer, so it's not it's different from like the RTX stuff that Nvidia does. But it's well, ray tracing is just a simplification path. Right. So like you can do things. Uh, does it have a, a bounce limit? Or? Yeah, it does. Uh, the yeah. So right now it's set to twelve. But you can crank that as high as you're willing to wait. So, yeah, and and you can do like, uh, I, I'm out of time. But you you can do things. You can make a cylinder, set it to glass, put a plane that's diffused, and then you can actually get caustics to render. And if you want, you can bake the caustics into a texture and use it somewhere else. But so it it's fairly state of the art, I would say. But yeah, all yeah or yeah. You know, so So it only it only runs on well I guess actually you know maybe it maybe it supports it so it's Nvidia biased like it won't run on an AMD GPU. Oh yes it will. But, oh yes it will. I. It's the Gimp of Fedora. Yeah. yeah I. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, if you're on Fedora, you install the Rockham Hit package and Blender instantly supports AMD. Uh huh. Yeah. There are also fun things like dynamic denoise. This is this is so when I was a kid, it's all this blurry um, noise everywhere. No, it uses but layers. It can. It uses it's AMD's implementation that they contribute. Smooth to the things it's, out. It's running on GPU on the Mac. It's using metal or something. Like that. The M1's weird because the GPU and the CPU are kind of. It's not at the. Yeah. Or, so. Yeah. But but I mean, it's not just Nvidia runs on Mac GPUs. You're saying. Or oh, I'm not using CUDA. This can use CUDA. But mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not using it right now. Yeah. The graphics API would need yeah. to be metal. The same. Yeah. yeah, it would need to be metal, not CUDA, on your Mac. Yeah, so and if you go into settings. Exa you exactly. You can, you can. Apple basically went like. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So you you can see it's so it's it using metal. it's using metal right now. Yeah. 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 Uh huh. So it's it's a yeah. Anyway. Yeah, the only GPU that I know of that doesn't support is Intel. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording now, but thank you.